Welcome to the recording of Connecticut NOFA's second field day in 2020. Um, we are focusing these field days on tillage reduction um, for the next couple of years. And we, our goal is to create an evening that will both inspire and challenge uh, many of us as organic farmers and gardeners um, to work towards tillage reduction um, as a means of increased soil health. Um, in the time since our first field day in May with Yoko and Alex at Asawaga Farm, tillage reduction has become uh, more and more popular. In fact, I was remarking that there is now a new documentary, uh, Kiss the Ground, that makes tillage reduction um, mainstream. You can download it from Netflix, um, and I encourage you to do so. Um, but it really does speak to how central this work is to the future of agriculture. However, what the documentary doesn't go into is how difficult this work is for many of our organic growers. Um, and tonight, uh, we are so grateful to have with us um, our farmers uh, who are part of the NRCS CIG Conservation Innovation Grant creates a community of practice around farmers who are trying to innovate um, and do no-till organics. Um, you will hear from Yoko and uh, at Asawaga Farm and, and Alex. Uh, you will hear from Roger Phillips at SubEdge Farm. Um, but our main focus as uh, tonight is Steve Mano from Masaro Farm in Woodbridge. We have to recognize that this is really the leading edge of our work. No-till and organics um, is something that is going to take some real thinking through and we're so grateful to have our three farmers uh, and be able to follow them over the course of this three-year program. So I'm going to turn this over to Monique who is going to just share with us since May we had you know a ton of people listening to Yoko and her small farm. Um, last year's field day was at Roger Phillips farm sub edge. Since that time they have been hard at work again continuing to innovate their practice. So Monique I will hand it over to you and you can share with us their updates. All right sounds great. Can, can everyone hear me okay? All right, um, well, the, we have several segments and we're going to start right away with um, Emily Cole. Uh, Emily Cole leads American Farmland Trust Climate and Agriculture Program in New England. And she's actually joining us with a recorded Zoom presentation. Since we have six speakers this evening, time is tight and we didn't have a chance to show her entire presentation, but we did put it on YouTube and the link is on CT NOFA website, so you can check that out. Meanwhile, this is, we're gonna play you an eight minute video that shows a really cool demonstration with a rain simulator and the effect tillage has on rain events. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to hear from Emily. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today. I wish I could be there with you, um, but we're all virtual and <laughs> I am virtually virtual as this is pre-recorded. But my name is Emily Cole, and I am the Climate and Agriculture Program Manager for uh, American Farmland Trust here in New England. I uh, work out of their Northampton office, or our Northampton, Massachusetts office, but I'm actually a Connecticut res resident. Um, I live up here in Simsbury, so wish I could be there for you, but um, I am going to take you down a little bit of the science background as to why no-till is great and what it can do for soil health and soil resilience. I am going to share my video. So uh, in today's day and age, we're seeing a lot of um, disturbance in our normal growing patterns, in our normal seasonal warm ups and cool downs, in precipitation and um, also in disease and, and pest issues. Unfortunately, that is um, due to the inability all around to adapt to climate change in a rapid manner. And it's not how plants work. <laughs> it's not how people work. And so what we can do instead of trying to adapt on a time scale that's infeasible is we can think about what processes and what types of practices can we put into place now to actually better prepare us um, to be more resilient and then eventually start to be able to actually mitigate the impacts of climate change. 
Okay, what we're going to have here on this next slide is uh, what's called a rainfall simulator or rainfall simulation. And you're actually going to be able to see the impacts that water can have on four different soil types um, that have been very recently tilled, sort of mid-range tilled, um, and all the way to something that has never been tilled. And you'll get to see a real clear picture visually of, of what happens here with water in these four different situations. And so what you can see right here is a setup where there were four bins and the first bin had this sample of soil from a field that was tilled two weeks ago. The, the next bin had something that was had soil that was tilled 10 months ago and it did have some cover crops on it. Then the third one is tilled 22 months ago, so almost a full two, two years, but then also with residue and cover crop. And then lastly, we have the never tilled hedgerow at the edge of the field, which has been in perennial vegetation for the whole time. And so uh, these samples of these four different fields have been uh, basically sliced out with some shovels and put into these pans. And what you can see here is that they are pouring water slowly in the top clear container. And that container has a bunch of small holes drilled into it to then simulate the, the drip of of rainwater onto the surface of these four demonstration soils. And what we're looking for is to see what's the difference in the water that actually is going through the soil down what would you know, typically be groundwater, what is running over the surface of the soil, which will come out into those four front uh, clear containers that you can see, and what is staying held within the soil. And we'll actually be able to see the difference of this pretty clearly in just a minute. And so as they get towards the end of their cups of water, you're gonna to begin to see the runoff of the four soils into these front pans. And so the first and the second certainly have a much uh, steadier stream of water coming off of those. And just as a reminder, that's the one that was tilled uh, very recently with nothing on it. And then the one that was tilled um, 10 months ago is the second one. And you can see right away the difference in the quality of the water coming off the surface as compared to the last two. And the last two, um, it's the third one is the 22 month ago tillage. And then the last one with that green lush plant matter is the hedgerow. And so what you can see here in terms of the numbers, <laughs> it's pretty clear that the sample that was very recently tilled had 240 milliliters of water run off the surface and it was very brown in terms of the color. Then the 10 month ago had about two thirds of that amount of water runoff. The sample that was tilled almost two years ago had very little, a tenth of the amount of water run off the surface. And then the one that was never tilled had almost nothing. And so looking at surface water, what we see here is protection from surface water erosion in the two samples that had not been tilled um, and the one that had been tilled almost two years ago. Not only is that water going somewhere else, but that is soil that is staying put that you're not losing. The water that infiltrated, so that's the water that actually goes down through those soils and would actually collect in a bottom pan. So that would be like the groundwater recharge. You could see that there are some differences, not as significant as the other. And the one that was tilled 10 months ago actually had a little more actually moved through it. When we look at the uh, tilled two years ago and the never tilled for that, we see almost three times as much um, move into those. So whether you're tilled uh, you know, two weeks ago or 10 months ago, you're still seeing a sort of similar impacts on the water infiltration. But when you've, it's been two years or never, you see significant improvement in how much water can move through. Um, and then in the bottom, that water absorbed, that's how much actually stayed within the soil. And so um, a little bit of difference between the two weeks and the 10 uh, months ago, for sure. And then we see not a whole lot of different ac difference across those. What we see here in, in this visualization of that is a no-till environment that allows water to move downward um, through a lot of different processes. One, there's a lot of air and space around the aggregation. You've got really good structure. But then two, when you have a really healthy diversified ecosystem, you've got lots of good things like worms that um, dig you know, burrows, and that actually is a great way for water to move into the soil. On top of that, when you have vegetation or stubble, it slows that water down, providing a greater opportunity for it actually to enter. On the other hand, we see this tilled ecosystem 
where you have very poor structure. It's pretty uniform in color. Uh, you could pick it up and it would sort of crumble. You don't see a lot of fine roots holding pieces together. You have a nice crust on top, especially when it's been dry. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen that in, in your fields. That's what really doesn't allow water to get into the soil. And instead, we see it running across the surface, pulling that topsoil away with it. And then what you see here is uh, visualization of this no-till versus conventional till. The bottom, you can see the no-till with all the stubble and the cash crop planted within the stubble with very little water standing on it. But the conventional till, you see a really soggy surface where that water cannot infiltrate. Above it, you see this really lush green. Well, that farm uses cover crops and no-till. Uh, if you look on the other side where you have the um, chisel disc use, not only is it less green, you know, I'd like you to see the difference in the width of the stream that runs from the lush green field into the chisel disc field. What you have there is stream bank erosion because that soil is not being as protected as, as well as the other side with the cover crops. And so you're losing soil. That stream is carving out more space from your field and you are um, really just watching your profits and your, your plant health and your soil health um, drift downstream. Uh, thank you all. I, I hope you all enjoy your uh, virtual field day and I wish I could be there virtually with you all. Um, I appreciate your time. I again am Emily Cole. I am um, from American Farmland Trust. I'm the Climate and Agriculture Program Manager. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email is ecole at farmland.org. Thank you. So um, thank you, Emily, even though she's not with us, she, she was. So I'm just going to introduce the next presentation. It's going to be Asawaga Farm, which is uh, a three quarter acre hand powered, no till certified organic farm in Putnam. And after the excellent tour that they gave uh, Yoko and Alex back in May, we thought it'd be nice to check in with them four months later and see how they're doing with the challenges of this year, including the pandemic, of course, but also drought, storms and life in general. So here's a recording from their barn this past Sunday. Hello everyone, this is Yoko and Alex from Asawaga Farm. It is September 13th and we are giving you an update on how our season is going. Yeah, it's been a crazy year with um, the drought and uh, COVID-19 and changing around marketing. Um, it's been quite a wild ride. Yeah, so I, the first thing that we wanted to talk about was the drought that we've had this season. We're lucky we have irrigation. We have a well with unlimited amounts of water. The one time that we had a really difficult time with was when our power went out for six days uh, following Hurricane uh, Isaiah. We had never used our generator before, but it's a, it's a really small one. So it wasn't able to power our walk-in together with the irrigation. So we would have to choose one or the other. And so it was just a constant like battle to keep our, keep our vegetables fresh as well as keeping our vegetables outside um, irrigated. So I think throughout August, we probably had, I mean, we definitely had less than one inch of rain. It was probably less than a half an inch of rain, honestly. So when that storm came in and knocked out our power for six days, um, we were in the midst of a heat wave. Uh, we were like three weeks into a drought. So that was pretty crazy. But uh, we are completely no-till. Every bed, every inch of our farm is no-till. We have a lot of things heavily mulched. And so the drought wasn't that bad. And the heat wave wasn't that bad. But, but not having power and not being able to uh, simply irrigate and, and keep everything cold, that was, that was bad. That was the biggest struggle we've had, I think, this season. So one thing that we like about no-till, one thing that we feel to be true about no-till is that if you are not pulverizing the soil and disturbing it so much, um, you are making it more resilient to things like a drought. So this year, the fact that we are no-till, we have been no-till for a few years now, we have relatively high organic matter, we use a lot of mulch, uh, we have strong microbiology, um, a great fungal population. I think that all of those factors kind of under the umbrella of no-till practices 
uh, really helped us to weather the drought more so than maybe a conventional farm does or somebody who is just transitioning into no-till. Yeah, that's something very, very positive about, about no-till and, and water usage. In previous years, we didn't mulch our beds. So this year we've been, um, that was one of our big focuses, to mulch every single bed. Even if it has something growing in it, we would mulch it. So uh, I think that certainly helped keep the moisture in. Yeah, we don't want to see bare soil ever <clears throat> on our farm. Um, yeah, so that was... So I think that really saved us through yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, there are five beds that we grew garlic in. So we, you know, sowed it last fall and harvested it this, this summer. And those beds are really heavily mulched. Just recently, maybe a few weeks ago, we flipped it into, you know, fall spinach and lettuce. And, and what we had to do was we removed the mulch and then amended the beds and broad forked it and then like put the mulch back on and then transplanted into the mulch like we've never seen crops grown so well in those beds and the soil underneath the mulch is just so rich and just like it was the softest bed yeah so those beds were definitely an, a good like indication of how well it kind of protects and feeds the soil even if there's nothing growing in it so yeah i'm excited because we're going to cover anything that's not cover cropped um, this fall is going to be heavily mulched, so we're going to do away with our tarps and, and uh, feed our soil that way. So um, that was a success, right? How about a failure? You wanted to talk about some interplanting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I kind of went all out on the interplanting, and there's definitely things I wouldn't do again. I mean, I, I don't think I'd really interplant as many, I would ever interplant as many things as I did this year. Um, but there's definitely combinations that worked really well that I could will continue doing, like peas and beets worked really well. You know, I tried to, with the whole idea behind um, having things growing in every corner of the bed with as diverse of a range of plants in a, in a bed as possible. I, you know, I just threw whatever we had, like next to, like, say, tomatoes or eggplants or whatnot. And it, that's just not the greatest way to go about it because obviously those things are going to compete with each other for nutrients. So I think you kind of have to be a little bit more aware of like what the growth habit is, how yeah, how much nutrients those those plants need. Yeah, we we had a horrendous tomato year, um, but that was probably mostly because we need to balance our soil more. But peppers were the real the real star throughout this whole drought, throughout the heat wave, throughout, I think they actually benefited from it. We were having just a phenomenal pepper year. Obviously, you know, this year was really challenging because of the pandemic and all of the changes that happened around marketing and things like that. When we started off the season, um, the past couple seasons, we've done two really big markets up in Boston and they were forced to change the way they do things quite a bit. One of our markets reacted very well um, and we stuck with them. And then the other market, they didn't really um, take responsibility and do what they needed to do. So we ended up having to leave that market just for personal safety reasons. But one of the great things that came out of that was we have always wanted to have a local presence. So we actually started doing a farm stand every Sunday uh, which just ended a few minutes ago, here right in our barn, just a few feet from where we're sitting right now. And that's been awesome to be a bigger part of the community, to kind of build a community and, and to, to serve some of our neighbors. That's, that's, that was a really um, positive thing that's come out of this whole pandemic situation. Yeah, we would have never done that if it weren't for the pandemic, so. Oh, and one more fun little thing, I guess, to end it on maybe. Um, we didn't cover anything this year. Oh, we, didn't, yeah. we didn't put a single row cover on, um, nothing. We to, didn't cover anything for insect protection. Yeah, yeah. for insect protection. Um, we're going to start putting some on now just to extend the season. And we had some on in the spring when we had a frost in June and everything. But um, throughout the season for pests, we just left covers off, didn't use any insect netting or anything. And, uh, and it really wasn't that bad. We really just want to bring everything into balance on our farm. And, uh, I think that's our update. Okay, so that was cool to get a peek at what they're doing. 
Um, we're going to speed along here and, in fact, go to SubEdge Farm right now. I'll, I'll do a, a little introduction from them. Um, this past Thursday, I actually took a drive to SubEdge, and it's in Farmington, Connecticut. That's where I met Roger and Isabel, who run the 10-acre farm with 26 farm crew staff. Um, Isabel was busy running the bustling farm stand, but Roger could take a break and, and show me around. So we're going to should look at a seven minute quick tour of their no-till field and some other highlights. So let's get this going here. Hi guys, this is Roger and I'm talking to you from SubEdge and it's a Saturday. We're here, we're gonna be looking at some of our no-till experiments this year. We're gonna be talking about um, or looking at some of our uh, livestock rotations. It's, like I said, Saturday, our farm store is open. Harvest time, obviously, we've got two more weeks of our CSA program left, and um, we're looking forward to this cooler weather and uh, a little more calmness in the, the scene here. So I'm, uh, we're standing in front of the no-till cedar. We're actually, we're using that this morning. Um, what we're doing right now is we were a little bit worried about our hay supply uh, for our beef cows for the winter. Our second cutting of hay was almost nothing because of the drought. So we had the idea of what if we did like a whole bunch of winter forage or spring forage um, for those guys to you know, get whatever we can. So we made a mix of triticale and uh, winter wheat, some forage peas, and we have some daikon radishes in there. The plan is if it grows enough in time for this fall or in the spring we're going to let our herd out into there and let them let them graze it so that's what we were doing uh, with this guy today so uh this is uh was our experiment with no-till tomatoes this season 250 foot beds that we did in a no-till method this summer um, so we had winter rye planted here in the fall of, of 2019 we crimped it in the summer and then once we had a good kill we uh, planted the tomatoes so we learned a few things it was very difficult to actually uh, punch holes into the soil through the straw so we had to do all that by hand um, we wanted to use a water wheel transplanter but it wasn't strong enough to punch uh, punch through and um, the timing wasn't exactly perfect either so this was a little bit of a late planting of tomatoes so obviously you see like we have been um, starting to pick some of the red ones, but um, they're not all ripe at this point. Um, but otherwise, this was an extremely healthy field of tomatoes. Uh, we had almost no disease in this in these two beds. You can see there are some weeds um, definitely coming up uh, through the straw, but otherwise it was kind of a low maintenance, um, no maintenance kind of thing other than, you know, the, the planting and uh, we did uh, do staking of these. All right, so uh, we we're just taking a pit stop to check, say hi to the cows. Our herd is uh, 23 in number right now. We're a couple mixed breeds, Highlanders, and we have a belted Galloway bull. So you'll see some kind of Highlander looking girls with the stripe. Um, and we have some purebred uh, belties as well. Hey folks, Monique interjecting here. The audio on this portion is windblown. So I just want to reiterate what Roger is talking about here. Here's what he said. We're doing some work on overseeding. We used the no-till seeder on this. About a week and a half ago, we put in some new grass and clover seed on their hay field. Uh, basically got like a truckload of minerals from Fertrell, mineral mix, calcium, uh, and fertilizer and so we've, we've been fertilizing our hay fields which we've actually never done before we've never taken the time to invest in that um, because it's kind of like uh, hay has always been a secondary thing but this year we had 10 calves born and our herd is getting a little larger and we're trying to take that a, a little more seriously as not just kind of a side enterprise but we uh, as we expand we want to uh, increase uh, you know the, the quality of the beef and the quality of the forage and the grass that they're grazing on to create a better product. All right, so uh, next pit stop we're taking to our sunflower field. 
we love to grow sunflowers. People are absolutely bonkers about them. They, they drive by, they stop, they take pictures. We do sell some of them as cut flowers, but the main reason we grow them is uh, for an oil product. So we combine them, we dry them, and we take them uh, to a screw press and we press them into oil and we sell it as a fresh uh, product. So we are dealing with the drought uh, situation like every like everybody else is. Um, we lost most of our fall brassicas. We're up here where we are, we didn't have enough water to irrigate them properly. It was our own fault for just not being prepared and not having the infrastructure set up. The sunflowers is another good example. They're only like this tall and I just assume that's from the drought. They just didn't grow very, very tall. One thing I will say is our no-till tomatoes. We didn't irrigate at all. We had drip tape set up on them and we just didn't feel like we needed to and they did just great. So thanks everybody for tuning in virtually here with us at SubEdge today. i um, just glad to take a few minutes to show, show you guys around. I think um, it's been a crazy year for us and crazy year for everybody in all different kinds of fields. And I just want to say a quick thanks to our farm crew who is uh, an incredibly awesome group of people and have worked extra hard this year to make sure everything's growing well. I know this is all about soil health, so I just wanted to give a little plug to um, the Real Organic Project, which we became a Real Organic Project certified farm this year. So to me, it's like organic what it used to, what it used to mean. So uh, it's soil based. So we care about the, the soil first and foremost. So um, check that out if you can and, and learn a little more about it. We are trying to think always, um, you know, we're always have to have to make a living. Um, so we're always balancing that with forward thinking and improving the soil. So whenever we can try to think about long term planning um, and cover cropping and doing any of those kind of things to uh, to build soil structure and better tilth and better soil life we're, we're trying we're trying as hard as we can to do that um, so anyway thanks again it was good to be here okay so there you have it uh, some some wonderful tours around uh, the state of Connecticut seeing what uh, these, these excellent farmers are, are up to and uh, now I would like to introduce Steve, who's joined us again. And um, it's the main event, the virtual tour of Massaro Farm, presented by Steve Nuno, who joined us live today from the farm in his farm in Woodbridge, Connecticut. So Steve is the farm manager at Massaro Community Farm. He's been farming at Massaro since 2009 and is responsible for reviving the land and bringing the fields back into production. So thank you for joining us, Steve. I'm gonna share my screen here and get some photos up, um, some of which uh, Monique took, oh, I think it was just a week ago now. Uh, so we can do a little bit of a virtual tour. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit about, you know, how we've dealt with things this year with, um, with COVID, with drought, with storms, and we'll talk a bit about cover crops and no-till and how we're doing those things and working with those things here. So just to start, I'd like to give an overview of, you know, who we are and what we're doing. Um, we are a, a certified organic and, and nonprofit farm. So um, I live here and manage the farm and have, um, you know, I moved here in 2009, 2010 was our first year of production. Uh, the, the Massaro farm, Massaro family had been, uh, they were Italian immigrants who had a dairy farm here for a couple generations and then, the, this property got put into a conservation easement with the town, uh, so it is now owned by the town of Woodbridge, and they lease uh, the the farm to to our organization, Masaro Community Farm. So the town doesn't get involved with the operation; but they have leased it to us. So our mission: keep farming, feed people, build community. We needed to reclaim and restore and steward this 57-acre property. Um, and wanted to get it up and running as a vegetable farm in 2010. So we started with four acres, did a pioneer CSA, 125 members. Uh, and now, you know, 10 years later, uh, now we have over 300 CSA subscribers, which is a bit of a change um, from last year. We had 240 and we're going to two farmers markets and had a number of restaurant sales uh, in the New Haven area. But with COVID, we, uh, ended up deciding not to go to the farmer's markets and, you know, obviously restaurants were closed. So sales, um, 
had been pretty minimal. And so we expanded our CSA and there was a lot more demand for that as well. So now we have over 300 subscribers uh, and we, we have an online store, which was new. And that we started right away in March, you know, a couple of weeks into the pandemic, we, you know, stopped selling to restaurants over the winter uh, with our with our high tunnel production and just offered it to, you know, to the community through a store and um, opened up the online store to uh, neighboring farms and, and farmer friends who had lost their markets or lost their sales outlets so that people in the community could get milk, eggs, uh, meat, mushrooms, you know, from other farms in the area through our store and do it all in, in one contactless pickup outside the farm. Um, so, and also as a nonprofit, we're committed to donating at least 10% of our produce and we offer on-farm educational programs and events throughout the year, but not this year, of course. So we've adapted a little bit to offer some virtual programs and events and such um, because that's what we've needed to do this year. So here's a look at the property. Uh, most of the 57 acres are woods and wetlands and you can see the, the fields defined there. Um, so that the rest are, are, are woods and wetlands. We've got a little trail through the woods for, for some hiking and, and such, but um, you know, 30 plus acres are, are woods and wetlands that we're not growing on. And here's a, a better look at, at those fields. Um, all right, so things that we usually have happen here, again, adjustments this year, we, we, we uh, usually offer a, a seedling sale. Maypole music workshops and such in the spring, a big dinner on the farm. On Labor Day weekend this year, we did it as a dinner from the farm and, and did a take home meal. And we typically offer a fall harvest festival and then a variety of workshops for adults uh, and youth as well. Uh, and also a summer camp usually for kids. So, you know, all of that needed to shift this year. Here's our farm crew or, uh, you know, a bunch of our farm crew from this year. Um, there's five or six of us working full-time for the full season and then another three or four working part-time and the height of summer um, June July and part of August August um, we had another five or six people uh, working with us and we you know just try and tried to set up a system where we could be distant where we could be safe we had um, some of the crew only working mornings um, we tried to keep some, some safety in, in our indoor spaces in the barn and um, we ended up doing all of our distribution outside of the barn this year rather than having anyone come into our space because there, there's not enough room for any any distancing in our barn which is pictured here so uh, I don't have a picture of it in the slide but usually we set up a big market tent uh, uh, a 10 by 20 foot tent right outside the door there of the barn and we set up a little contactless drive-through pickup for our CSA and this year you know we ended up pre-bagging everything so typically we let people come into the barn and um, we'd have crates of, of all the produce out and for people to pack their own bags and and, and have some uh, some choice in their CSA but this year we we did it all as a pre-bagged pickup Uh, just a quick look at our high tunnels. We've got six high tunnels here, uh, which have been really key for our growth, uh, no matter what the weather issue is. So in, in droughts, in, in uh, overly wet years, in, in overly cold years, um, the high tunnels have really, have really been a big asset in um, mitigating the damage or the potential damage from um, whatever the environmental hazard may be. It, it, it's, you know, not a perfectly controlled environment, but it's, it's, um, it's protected. And um, so in here, we're growing grafted tomatoes. Um, this actually was a little bit of a new system for us. We, we've been growing grafted tomatoes for another, for a number of years now, but these are planted um, a bit tighter than, than, than we've done previously. Um, we added these uh, white strips of fabric uh, over the black fabric that we've got in the ground and it's really it's really been a wonderfully productive year for us in our in our tunnels with tomatoes um, we were able to take sort of two tunnels worth of tomatoes and turn it into one tunnel we used to space them out at three feet and now we've got them spaced at one foot um, really tight um, double liters and pruned on a weekly basis until a couple of weeks ago where, or mid-August where we topped them and, and now we'll end up doing our final harvest in the next uh, 10 days and we'll transition these to winter greens 
uh, by mid-October. And then here we've got um, carrots growing on the left and then peppers and cherry tomatoes. Uh, it's the first time in a long time we've grown cherry tomatoes in the tunnel. We were hoping to be growing these for a farmer's market this year, but um, ended up just going to our CSA. And where the carrots are, there should be eggplants glow growing, but uh, our eggplants did not do very well. Uh, in there, we had about a third of the plants doing wonderfully in the back a third doing poorly in the middle and a third doing terribly in the front. So uh, we gave them some time and then ripped them out and, and put some carrots in their plates, which are doing very well and we'll, we'll harvest um, late fall, early winter. And this is some mid August planted kale and chard, which we'll be able to harvest throughout the winter. We've got hoops in place ready to cover. We were fortunate enough not to get a frost uh, last week we just were in the upper 30s, uh, but we were preparing for frost if we needed to, to cover for, for warmth in there. And we have some newly planted uh, lettuce, which we'll harvest throughout the fall in here. All right. Um, I want to just share a number of photos over the years of some of the work we've done with cover crops and with living paths and such. So here we've got onions and kale planted in plastic and all the paths are in um, buckwheat, um, which has typically worked pretty well for us. So it, you know, it comes up very quickly and helps uh, suppress other, uh, other growth, other weeds that might be in there. And then the, you know, the bees absolutely love it. So it's, it's a really nice spot for pollinators. You're gonna see, I like buckwheat a lot. So here's it a little later in the season, that same kale um, and onions flowering. We've got it growing next to um, our squash in the paths. We've done this with both summer squash and winter squash. A little bit easier with winter squash because you can just sort of set it and forget it. Uh, with summer squash, if you're in there daily, eventually you're gonna trample this down, but it, it, it still works pretty well uh, in place of what might be growing there instead on our farm, which would be grasses and weeds and things that we don't want. We also do it in our potato paths. So if the potatoes are covered um, and the, the buckwheat is growing in the paths. There's one big sheet. You know, we, we're a pretty windy farm and though um, being on top of the hill, the, the big sheets are what I prefer to cover with, but uh, when the wind is up, the big sheets always get blown off and, and ripped and the, the single sheets or, or double double beds, the single beds or double beds tend to hold a little bit better uh, in windy conditions. I've even had some single beds, you know, of row cover stay in place through some major storms and hurricanes, uh, which the big sheets definitely cannot cover. So that's, that's about a 30 foot wide um, sheet of row cover there. And we've got a full field of buckwheat here. This was some years ago as I was getting this field ready for planting. Uh, I also really like the buckwheat in, in fall brassicas. So once the plants are, are up, uh, you know, I don't want to overwhelm the young, young brassicas with it, but um, you know, over sowing it and letting it grow up under the plants. And then once there's a frost, it'll just kill in place. Um, so it's a good way to get a fall cover in a spot where you've also got a crop going. So here's a look at that full field of, of fall brassicas with uh, frost killed buckwheat. Other things we like to do for, for uh, cover crop in pathways, um, oats, oats and clover or barley and clover um, in these full season plants like eggplants and peppers and tomatoes. Um, this year we tried putting some fabric down instead you know, as we've grown from growing on four acres to growing on over 10 acres, um, managing these paths has become the biggest challenge. It, it's really sort of a continual mowing and weed whacking and, and push trimming, which is, you know, a weed whacker on wheels. Uh, and it's, it's a lot and it's not work that um, I think we all like doing. So, you know, we tried putting some fabric down in its place. But the fabric just doesn't go perfectly or we weren't able to get it perfectly from plastic to plastic. So there's still some weed whacking or push trimming that needs to happen. Um, so I'm not sure how we'll go forward, but I think probably some mixture of 
of fabric and, and living paths um, to cut down on how much weed whacking we need to do um, is probably in our, in our future. So yeah, we'll probably maintain some, some living cover and some paths. Um, cherry tomatoes are a you pick crop for our CSA subscribers. So we like to have a living path there um, and then just keep it mowed, you know, um, uh, every other week or so, um, so that it's a, a clean walking path for our, for our uh, customers. And then, you know, we grow, strawberries are an important crop for us, for our CSA and for our, for our markets. Um, we leave them in for two years. So getting a nice, um, a nice grass alongside um, helps keep that intact. This is from a long time ago, growing Sudan grass um, between beds of winter squash. We used to leave a whole bed open between the winter squash to allow them to stretch out and we grew um, Sudan grass between them. Uh, I ended up deciding that buckwheat was a better choice to do that. And also we no longer leave a full bed uh, in uh, open between them to do that. But I'd like to see if we could get back to it or grow a different crop um, between the winter squash beds and under sow it with, with buckwheat. So that's what, what I'm thinking about as a change for next year. Here's a, a mix of Sudan, Sudan grass and sun hemp. We added the sun hemp to get a legume in there um, and also matches kind of the growth habit growing, growing tall and won't get, won't get um, shaded out by it. And then here we are mowing it. Uh, you can see it, it gets real tall at about six feet is when we wanna cut it um, and then let it regrow. And so by cutting it, that'll send uh, you know, more energy down to the roots and, and get it to regrow. Um, and there it is in October, kind of starting to die back. Um, and we just let that winter kill and, and, and uh, protect the soil over the winter. Uh, this is from this year in a, in a field we've been trying to reclaim. Um, photo from late May, rye and, and uh, crimson clover. Um, it grew really wonderfully and I was, I was hoping that it would suppress the growth of uh, mugwort and goldenrod and all things that grow wild in this field that we've been trying to reclaim. Uh, it, it worked great in the spring, but if you walk out there now, it, it's mostly mugwort, unfortunately. One of the other things we like to do um, is on the edges of our fields have these kind of hedgerows of, of flowering, um, flowering crops for pollinators. So the, here's a nice look at some, some clover along this field edge early this spring. And there's kind of a close up look. There's some vetch, some clovers. We had some um, dill and cilantro that we were growing late in the spring too that flowered and, and we let regrow and flower up there as well this year. We've got a whole path of clover kind of set behind our tunnels, which was a really nice mix of colors this spring. And then we, we've got about 30 feet between our tunnels and we do, we do grow in beds there. And then um, we had a, a, a peas, vetch, oats and, and clover um, cover crop over the winter, the peas and the oats winter kill. And then we had um, the vetch and the clover thriving this spring uh, just for height comparison. And because I like to share pictures of my daughter, that's Vivian there cover crop was taller than, her, taller than her. She loved wading through through it, picking little bouquets of flowers from it and, and tromping through it all. You can see that there. That was kind of a daily spring activity. Um, so here's a close-up look from the peas, vetch, and oats in October. This was sown in probably mid-August which is why you can see such good growth of the vetch. If, if you sow later in September, you might not see much of the vetch growth until the spring. And I just wanted to point out this photo. If you look on the left, you've got newer seed and on the right, you've got older seed. So, um, you know, both turned out just fine, but the, the newer seed definitely had um, more vigorous growth and you can see it with sort of brighter, richer um, and uh, fuller, uh, better germination uh, in this field here. Same same field, uh, January, end of January after some snow melt, you can see the vetch starting to green and, and come through. 
the, the winter killed peas and oats. And then late May, it's just a full field of uh, vetch. It really spreads and takes over. It's a pretty amazing um, cover crop. And, you know, I like doing that pea, vetch, and oat mix because, you know, after I, we've harvested a crop and we spread the peas, vetch, and oats, then we can leave it and, and you're getting multiple uh, periods of growth. You get a good growth, a lot of biomass in the fall. You get the winter kill protection. And then without doing anything, you end up with a with another field of, of fully grown biomass vetch, which makes a lovely flower. And then you just have to be careful to not let it go too far because it, um, you know, it is a vine. So you, you got to mow this down. If you let it get too viney, it's going to get tangled in the mower. Uh, I learned that lesson a couple times. And then, so this is two, this is a different field uh, where we had the vetch growing, but um, we did two mowings of it um, and we're able to, you know, remove any residue um, with a time weeder and then it's, it was ready to plant. This year was the first year we actually did a pea, vetch, and oats sowing uh, in, in the spring. So I've, I've always thought about it as a fall cover crop, but um, uh, sort of tried to rethink it a little bit and, and sowed it in the spring and it did wonderfully. So it was sown in early April. It wasn't too quick to germinate, so I was getting a little nervous after a few weeks. But once it got going, it, it came up quick, you know, as the days were getting longer and, and, and warmer. Um, so this is what it looked like by mid-June, you know, with full flowering peas and vetch uh, and oats. A little closer up look, a little clover in there as well, was left over. And here's what a, a, another look at the full, a full field of it in, in July. Uh, and then from earlier, um, this was just from last week, some buckwheat that we sowed in, in mid-August as soon as our onions were out of the ground. We put some buckwheat down. You know, one of the things we try to focus on here, as soon as a crop or a bed is done, it goes immediately into cover crop, just absolutely as fast as we can. So, you know, I, right now we're hustling with cover crops the way we do with, with our cash crops in the spring. You know, as soon as we're able to transition something, you know, if it can be the day of, as soon as that crop is harvested, it's, you know, the residue is mowed, we seed the cover crop, uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get that cover crop up and growing. Uh, this is a pea, vetch, and oat we sowed right after finishing a summer squash harvest this, this fall. Another space between our tunnels, peas, vetch, and oats growing up. Uh, and now this takes us to our, our no-till plot. Uh, so last year, our no-till plot did not perform well in terms of crop production, but we've had some, we've had some great cover crops there. So um, tw in 2019, we started with a, a rye and vetch cover crop. We mowed it, tarped it, removed the tarps, prepped our beds, planted um, winter squash and potatoes in that field. The plants all grew well, but the, the yield was, was near zero, essentially for both crops. We had good looking plants uh, on the squash. We had, we had fruit, but the fruit basically all rotted. Um, and uh, we had decent looking potato plants. We had some leaf hoppers we typically do, but um, really low yield on the potatoes. So it was essentially a full failure in that field. Um, I think part of that is, you know, it was a very wet year. It, this is a wet corner of our farm. Um, and those crops both got in much later than we typically would put them in. Uh, but as soon as, you know, we were done with it, we, we got into a great cover crop of peas, vetch, and oats, which grew very well. And um, by April, you know, we just have uh, the vetch growing through the residue of the peas and the oats. Um, here's a little close up view of that. Um, looked really nice and it grew very well. Um, this is a, a sort of a different area because I didn't get a good uh, full view, but uh, elsewhere on the farm, same same deal. Peas, vetch, and oats in the fall, and here's what the vetch is growing up to be. Um, nice, dense biomass. So what we did then was, uh, you know, before it got to the tangling, destroying mower portion, we mowed it down. Um, 
and we pulled some tarps over it. We pulled the silage tarps over. We ended up leaving it on seven to eight weeks. Um, so this was a um, late May mowing and a removal in mid July. And you can see all the residue there on the ground. Um, so I just drove over with a, with a tine weeder and was able to rake all this residue to the ends. So, you know, what we've ended up planting here is a mix of fall brassica, uh, some directly sown carrots, some um, arugula, some mustard greens, some radishes, which are, aren't really gonna direct so well through this. Uh, we did do some transplanting and we did some uh, paper pot transplanting as well, which also is not going to make it through this kind of residue. So we raked it to the end of the field and took that residue to our compost piles um, and then needed to uh, reset the bed. So here's, here's another look at that field. And here's what it looks like now. Um, we've got carrots up uh, in the foreground and then row cover over our um, salad mix and newly sown radishes there in the middle of the field. I think flea beetles are the pests that we deal with most on the farm overall. So, so flea beetles on brassicas, um, flea beetles on eggplants are also a thing that you know, usually they grow through, but flea beetles on brassicas are the thing that uh, I'd say bother us the most. So. This is sort of a preventative, keep them off of, of our um, particularly salad mix, but also um, maybe if we can, if we can get it on for the first bit of the radish growth, that's, that's helpful as well, just to get them up and started. Uh, we've got overwintered onions planted in this field. We've got some beets, um, some lettuce, uh, and some, some turnips as well. And we'll take a look at some of that. Here's our row cover. Underneath going, going pretty well in there. Um, we, you know, also have been dealing with drought. Uh, we haven't had to water much in this field. You know, I've been monitoring it, but uh, you know, it's been two full weeks now since we've had any bit of rain. So I just turned on some water in there this morning, actually, to try to keep those up and going. Uh, here's a look at the paper pots. You can see these skinny beets not growing well through the paper pots. Um, this is just our second year using paper pot transplanting and one of the great things is that it's, it goes very quick on the planting. So I did, uh, you know, I planted our overwintered onions, you know, a few thousand plants in an hour by myself. Um, I, there's no way I could do that, um, you know, by hand. So, you know, typically our, our crew does a great job of getting all these plants in the ground quickly um, and the paper pot just, uh, expedites that but not everything has worked as well you know we ran out of our four inch paper pots and and tried beets in the six inch you know and i don't know if it's the time of year or something that didn't go well but this these beets just simply did not work work out so here's a here's a closer look at the the beets failing um you know there's, there's a handful of decent beets in in this bed but mostly they look long and skinny like this and these are not the cylinder variety that are meant to grow like that these are meant to be round beets so here we are. Uh, and then, you know, in the neighboring bed, we've got Hawkeye turnips and scarlet turnips, which for the most part went exactly as they meant to uh, grow, exactly as they're meant to grow. So you, you can't even see the paper pot anymore. You know, it's a two inch paper pot. They're, they're planted close together and we've got, you know, nice sizable um, turnips in there. We've also done spinach. That's been a really great thing for the fall. Uh, you might be able to see a little bit of leaf minor damage there. That's that's the other pest that bothers me a lot. It, it, it hasn't seemed to have been an issue with our beets and chard, but always seems to bite our spinach. And of course, there's much less tolerance for that kind of damage uh, in the spinach. But most most of the crop here is looking pretty good. So there's a closer look at that, and you can you can see the those first couple plants have a good bit of of the leaf miner damage. And there's just starting to come up that uh, first bit of uh, mustard mix, the salad greens there. Uh, and here's a rainbow because we should have a rainbow. There's, there's some good moments even in a year where lots of things are difficult. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's all the slides I've got. Um, I know I went through a, a lot there, but uh, happy to open it up for any kind of Q&A. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. 
really informative. Um, I know that Dina and I both have questions. And in fact, we have a, a question in the chat. Um, and one of them says, how do you incorporate the Sudan grass? Do you still use the silage tarps to break down all that biomass? So for the Sudan grass, and I'll say it, it's been a couple of years since I've been able to grow um, Sudan, like fit that cover crop in the mix. It really wants to get sown, you know, um, somewhere mid June to mid or early July to get the best growth out of it. And the, the great thing about it is you do get lots of biomass. Um, and it does, is also good at, um, you know, penetrating uh, layers of the soil as well. So um, mowing it before it gets um, too unruly, so at about six feet, and then I think it's possible, I think breaking it down with a salad sharp might be necessary in the spring, but we didn't really need to. I, you know, we, gave, we would give it a couple of mowings and then it'll die back, you know, pretty early um, in the winter. And so, you know, it's a good residue in the spring, which might be able to be raked off or just planted through. Um, but if I were eager to get something in there, um, I might need to use a tarp early in the spring. Got it. Um, I was curious about that no-till field where um, you, you, you weren't getting production, you were getting any yields? I mean, it was basically a total failure um, last year, which happily for us is, was tolerable. Like the potatoes and winter squash aren't hugely important crops for us. We grow a small amount to feed our CSA, like a taste of those crops. Um, you know, it's still always sad when something doesn't work out and you've, you've spent time in it and it's um, no fun picking up rotten squash from the field. Um, but, you know, there was a, there were a mix of things that it's always hard to identify exactly what went wrong, you know, but I think both the lateness of planting, the wetness of the year, um, you know, didn't go well, but, but um, you know, the cover crop prior to that and after that were both quite um, robust and this year's fall crop, except for those beets, which are too skinny, are, are looking good. Right. I'm wondering if the, because that field tends to be wet, the brassicas are doing better. For example, Roger, with his brassicas, that was the big problem, that there wasn't enough moisture with this drought year. So it's kind of telling that maybe brassicas you want to put in a field that tends to be wet. Like that moisture in the, and it's a good it's a it's a good spot for them that you know our no-till plot is in kind of a shady corner of the farm too so it, it's really it's not a great spot for a heat loving crop uh, you know or a crop that wants more sun it's a you know it's in a corner that has uh, woods on the south and the east to it so it gets you know early morning shade and then um, sun late in the day um, which for brassicas is going to be fine uh, and we do you know we're lucky in a lot of ways to have um, the soil we do. I mean, it's, it's incredibly rocky, but in a dry year, um, you know, we've, we've got a, a glacial hard pan just a few feet down and the, the soil retains moisture very well uh, and we have irrigation available. So, you know, we've been able to control the water in a dry year and, and these dry years have, have, have all been great for us. You know, we've had, a, we've had worse drought years than this and dry years have, have typically been better for us than wet years. Cool. All right. Um, here's a question. What are you looking forward to doing with that field next year? Oh, that was, I guess, what we just asked. <laughs> oh, yes. What well, are you going to do next year? Yeah, next year, um, you know, every year is such an adjustment and you don't, it's hard to know what's going to, what's going to happen next. Um, you know, I'd say last year, I didn't know that there was going to be winter squash and potatoes in that field because of the incredible wetness that we were experiencing last year. We really had to change our planned rotation and we ended up, you know, there with squash and potatoes later. So next year, um, I don't know what crops will be there, but I, actually one of the things that, I, that I'd like to do is, is not have to reshape the bed. So that was something that needed to happen this year. The, and it might've been because we were digging some potatoes that the, the integrity of the beds didn't, didn't stay as well. Um, so we ended up um, needing to chisel the beds to kind of redefine them. And then, and then I drove over with our, our manure spreader to spread a, a thin layer of compost. So that, that's what we did to, to sort of reestablish the beds. Um, and this year I'm hoping that we, we don't, or next year that we don't have to chisel, but that just going over with a thin layer of either um, broken down leaf mulch that, that we compost or leaves that we'll receive this fall um, 
might help maintain those beds a little bit better. So, yeah. But I don't know what will grow, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we can um, uh, avoid making a pass with the chisel plow. Ryan has a question. How are you mowing the vetch? Have you tried to flail mow? Also, what kind of weed pressure did you have in the, I guess, oats, vetch, and peas with tarp? Yeah. Um, yes, we are flail mowing the vetch. Um, and I think the, uh, you know, if you let it, if you let the vetch get too big, it can, um, it can definitely wind its way into a flail mower. Uh, it'll definitely wind its way into, a, you know, a rotary mower or brush hog. Um, I, I've had it wind around both kinds of mowers, but I think the, the flail mower is a little less uh, prone to that just because of its uh, of its action. Um, so we're going slow with the flail mower, and and I'm really eyeing that that flowering time and not letting it get too too tangly in there. So it's something I'm, I'm watching kind of daily in, in the spring to make sure I don't let it get there because. I really don't want to be pulling the, the vetch out of my mowers. Uh, <laughs> right, that gets tangled. And the weed pressure, um, you know, it, I guess it really depends on what we had, you know, what the weed pressure looked like before, but the, the hope is uh, that it's pretty minimal. I mean, we'll, we'll see some other things growing in there for sure, but um, I guess I'll tend to go um, a little bit heavier on the um, seeding amounts to make sure that we we don't have much weed pressure. Generally, um, our cover crop fields have been dominated by cover crop with real minimal weed pressure. Now, weed pressure does come up afterwards. So I'd say in the no-till field where we had those tarps on for seven to eight weeks, I, I was hoping to not see a single weed. We, we did see some weeds, um, but not much of, you know, we've made a few passes through um, with wire weeders and scuffle hose on the edges of those beds, uh, but it's been pretty minimal. All right, awesome. Uh, Liz is asking, do you underseed any crops with cover crops? One of the ones I do in the fall, and this is kind of, well, you know, every, I think there's a lot of pockets of, um, of cold in the Northeast and even in Connecticut, you know, like I said, we didn't get hit with frost and, uh, last week, but other towns right next to us did and other farms right nearby did. Uh, but I like, I like um, the underseeding or overseeding buckwheat in the fall brassicas. That, that's one of my favorites um, uh, because it'll grow right up in there and then it'll frost kill. And, you know, we've had years here where our first frost and actually last year, our first frost was early October. And we've had other years where it hasn't happened until late November. So, you know, the falls, uh, you know, maybe unfortunately are getting warmer and warmer, but it's been great for our cover crop growth, uh, whether it's been the pea vetch oats mix, which I like a lot. Um, I'm really careful with doing rye just because it's so hard to terminate in the spring, but the, the tarps have been, have been pretty successful with that. So flail mowing and tarping has been our, our best key to uh, terminating rye. Um, so rye and vetch or rye and clover are all, all things that I've oversown into any, any fall crops, uh, where if I wait till the crop is done, um, I wouldn't be able to get something in. Are you using black tarps or solarizing? Yeah, the black solid tarps. I, I do have some old greenhouse fabric or plastic that I'll keep around, uh, for solarizing, but I've really only used it a handful of times. Okay. Um, here's a, a nice quote from, uh, Jim Hyde. Seeing these farms and all the green cover crops is absolutely energizing. Thanks to all the, the, for, the farms for sharing these stories. Steve always learns so much from your talks. So that yeah. was nice. And Liz says, I'm excited to see large scale conventional growers under seeding corn, something I started to do 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's excellent. Um, and I don't know if Dina wants to join us. She had, had a couple of questions. Um, but uh, the, the other thing that I, I, I did want to mention, this event was funded by an NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant. So, um, so that's really key to make this all possible. Hi, Dina. Hi again. Um, Steve, Mike, I had two questions. One is um, you mentioned sort of manage, trying to manage for perennial weeds. One of my fears in transitioning to no-till is really around mugwort and, and some of those nastier things. Have you had any luck with that Sudan grass, et cetera? You were saying you were concerned about mugwort management there. Did, was it successful? 
You know, I was I was hopeful this uh, this spring because you know I spent time in in a field that we're working to reclaim um, last year, uh, doing way way too much tillage, like a lot of a lot of disking, re repetitive disking to try to cultivate out a lot of the um, weeds in the, in this field, and then got a really beautiful stand uh, of rye and clover. Um, which looked great in the fall and great in the spring. And just as that died back, you know, I, it's not a field we're actively growing on, so I wasn't in there, but just, I mean, there's just been decades of um, mugwort seed <laughs> there. So it, it will not be denied. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure. I think, you know, there's one, there's one plot and, and nearby where we planted pollen, a little pollinator strip last year, you know, where we, we had fabric on for, for much of the year and then pulled it off and, and planted. Um, I think that might end up being the, the best way is really sort of um, mowing or, and then trying to put something else there and mowing that down and then tarping it for a while. Um, but we're doing that on a, you know, on a tarp basis. We've got one plot, one 30 by 100 plot where we currently have fall carrots, you know, that we just did some removal of, you know, the, the mugwort, the nuts edge, um, even some, you know, Canadian thistle in there. Um, it didn't, you know, it didn't take much to, to remove the weeds, but we're gonna have to stay on it. So one, one year of tarping uh, wasn't enough for the, the weed bank in that, that little area. Yeah. What, one other question I had, and uh, forgive me if I'm jumping the line here in the chat, but the um, other question I had is about equipment. So for someone like me, who is sort of a, a similar size farm transitioning um, or, you know, taking my toe in the water of tillage reduction, um, what would you say are the most essential sort of first pieces of equipment? Um, I'm going to go to sleep tonight dreaming of a push behind weed whacker, a wheeled weed whacker. What is that? <laughs> first of all, what is that? And second of all, are there other central pieces of equipment that you would say um, every farmer should have in their wheelhouse before they try to uh, stop tilling at scale? Uh yeah, so at this scale, I mean, the the flail mower, you know, was one of my first purchases on the farm, and I just I like that for for the best breakdown of of your cover crop residue. And though I started with a with a Vicon spin spreader for the for the tractor, um, I now have a drop spreader, uh, which I'm using for both seed and soil amendments and such. Um, and that's that's just more. It's more precise. I mean, I, I did it actually more for the for the soil amendments than for the cover crop. The co cover crop is kind of nice to to fling about, um, but the the drop spreader is just more precise. And I and I, I have fewer pockets of uh, uh, areas where there's no seed. So now I know I, I'm uh, I'm getting seed exactly where I want it and amendment exactly where I want it. You know, right behind the tractor as I go. Uh, whereas the spin spreader was, you know, flinging it, you know, 20 feet in either direction. And sometimes, you know, you have spots that you're not hitting. Um, so, so I, I was pretty happy to transition to the, the drop spreader for that, for the cover crop seed. Uh, you know, I still sometimes use the over the shoulder bag as well uh, for spreading small spots like between the tunnels and such. I'm not, I'm not hopping on the tractor for every bit of cover crop sowing, but um, for the larger spots, you know, I mean, if you're doing a, if you're doing a lot of acreage, the spin spreader is probably the right tool. But the drop spreader has been great for for this acreage. And then new to us, we've only had it for a couple of years now. The uh, manure spreader, which we're using to spread compost and leaves, um, has been pretty key, I think. Um, and I, I think it's going to help with with the no till, but just being able to drop leaves on it. So we collect leaves from local landscapers, or they they use us as a resource to drop off leaves. And then, you know, we've been using that for years to mulch our garlic. So we do, you know, our garlic, uh, we would just drag it over with tarps. We would sort of um, pull it over our beds and then pull the tarp out and leave the leaves there. But now we can load it into a spreader and, and, and drop it over the beds. And I want to do that with more of our beds, you know, in a similar way that, that um, Yoko and Alex were talking about, um, you know, mulching more of those spaces, not leaving anything covered so, or uncovered or bare. So in places where maybe we can't get a good um, cover crop going, we, we can protect it with mulch. 
Um, and so I've used that compost, the manure spreader, you know, never for manure. I've used it for compost. I've used it for leaves and I've even used it with wood chips. So we get a lot of, uh, you know, tree work uh, in the area and they need to dump wood chips. And I've used that um, for some areas as well. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so a few, I see that we're out of time. Steve, thank you. Um, again, these, these presentations are so inspiring. Thank you to Monique. Um, Monique worked very hard and, and has been tireless, tirelessly uh, converting herself from soil technician to videographer to farm visitor. Um, and I'm so, so grateful to Monique and Caro um, and all the farmers who were able to participate this evening. Um, do stay in touch with NOFA, obviously, to um, find out about more events this fall and winter. Um, we will remain virtual for the foreseeable future. Um, but again, I'm so grateful to see you all here with us this evening. So thank you all and have a wonderful night. We will be in touch. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Thank you.